Have your Bible, turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 6. While you're turning there, uh, when I was in, I guess you'd call Bible college, uh, the founder was known for many fa famous sayings. And one of the, the sayings that was on a wall somewhere was this. The test of your character is what it takes to stop you. We were just told in the teaching that Brother Craig shared with us that we're all in the ministry, right? Informally, we're all in the ministry. We all are to be a part of what is called in chapter 5, the ministry of reconciliation. That is bringing people to Jesus so that they can be reconciled to him. Well, we saw the motivation. What is it that motivates us to be part of bringing people to the Lord? Participating as ministers of reconciliation. We looked at that last week when we were in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. But now we want to ask the question, not what motivates you, but what does it take to stop you? What would it take to get you to drop out of the race? What would it take to stop you from living the Christian life and being involved in serving the Lord? Would it involve some incredible difficulty that you're up against? Or maybe people starting a, a hate campaign against you? Or what about uh, maybe a doctrinal or a moral deviation in your life? Because we ought to be aware of this. Our arch enemy, the wicked one, he will do all that he can to try to stop you and me and make us quit. He doesn't want us to continue in the Christian life. He certainly doesn't want us to bring other people to Jesus. He wants to discourage us and to get us to just stop. Maybe some he doesn't have to work too hard on. He knows. But if you're facing opposition and you're seeking to live a, a life for the Lord and uh, minister and please him, you can expect that it's not going to be always easy. Let's take a moment and let's look to the Lord in prayer. And I want to show you in this sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians three things that he wants to use to stop you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can have this time together this morning. Thank you that we have a Bible. We're not left here just to uh, grope in the darkness, but you, you've given us the light. And we pray that uh, you would turn the light on in our understanding this morning. We pray that we would understand the truth that you have for us. And so we, again, pray for that anointing of the Spirit of God. He is our unction from the Holy One. We need your unction to hear from you and to understand what it is that you have to say to your church, Spirit of God. And if there be any that don't know you as Savior, may this be the day of salvation, as the very scripture that we're looking at this morning says. May it be a reality. We just thank you again for our time together and praise you for speaking to our hearts, give us, again, ears to hear, hearts to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the first things that you'll see in the first 10 verses of this sixth chapter of 2 Corinthians is that Satan will use tribulation to try to discourage you and get you to stop. It isn't easy to serve the Lord. Sometimes I think that people have uh, uh, a glamorous view of ministry. Ministry is difficult. Whenever you're dealing with people, you're dealing with difficulties. And uh, you will find things that you had not even anticipated happening that uh, pop up unexpectedly. 
it is not easy to serve the Lord. It's not easy to be a Christian. And I don't want ever to give that false impression that when you become a Christian, life becomes smooth. It doesn't. In fact, the way God builds Christians and strengthens them is through the difficulties that pop up in our lives that he wants us to walk through and trust him and get victory and conquer them through his power. The devil wants to discourage, discourage us because he wants us to quit. And one way in which he seeks to do that is by using the tribulation that comes into our lives to bring deep discouragement. As Paul begins this sixth chapter, notice how he says it. He says, we then as workers together with him. With who? With the Lord. Because, and, and again, you gotta, you got to remember there were the, the chapter divisions in our Bible are not inspired. Okay? The words of our Bible are inspired, but not the chapter divisions. And so you got to think what was said just prior to this sixth chapter. He was saying, again, we are all in the ministry of seeking to reconcile people to God, bringing people back to the Lord. There was a great departure. It began in the Garden of Eden. And it is God's work on that cross that builds the bridge for human beings to get back to God. Remember, we said that to become a new creature in Christ is explained for us in verse 15 of chapter 5, which means we no longer live unto ourselves, but we live for him who died for us and rose again. And so basically... To be a believer, to be a new creation in Christ, is to not live a self-centered life. It's to live for others. And to live for others is to seek to bring them back to God, to bring them back to a position of uh, a changed position of peace with God. That's the ministry of reconciliation. And he, that's what he's talking about when he says in verse 1 of chapter 6, I beg you. <laughs> I, I, we're workers together in this ministry. It's not just me, the apostle. And folks, it's not just me, the pastor. It's not just uh, paid full-time Christian workers. We're workers together. Thankfully, we're workers together with him, with God. Isn't that amazing? We work together, not only with ourselves, but we work together. We're co-laborers with God himself. And that's the, that's the effectiveness of our service. We're workers together with him. And he says, I beg you, I beseech you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, he's talking to believers here. And he, this is an exhortation he's given them in the first three verses. Before the list of difficulties that uh, equal the tribulation that Satan wants to discourage and get us to quit with, before he even lists those difficulties of affliction, he exhorts the Corinthians about their poor response to the ministry, to being workers together with God. Their poor response, they, they had a half-hearted compliance. And, he, uh, and he's disappointed, really, and he's burdened because he expected them to join him in this work together with the Lord and make the most of being ambassadors of this message of reconciliation. Especially because, as he says in verse 2, for he saith, he's quoting from Isaiah 49 and verse 6, he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored or helped thee, behold, now is the accepted time, behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, listen to me. That verse, too, is often used to uh, encourage people that are not saved to get saved now, to get saved today, because today, now, is the day of salvation. That's true. That's absolutely true. But that's not the context of this statement here. He's quoting Isaiah 49, and Isaiah 49 is all about Jesus the Messiah. 
It's a messianic prophecy about Jesus the Messiah who is going to restore Israel once again. And so this is messianic, what he's saying here. Because of the Messiah, it, he's, he is telling them because of the Messiah who has come and fulfilled and is in the process of fulfilling Isaiah 49. Now you can expect to, to experience power in this message of reconciliation that you preach. And so that's uh, what he's trying to encourage them with. At the same time, he's concerned that their lives do not discredit or hinder bringing people to Jesus. He says in verse 3, giving no offense in anything that the mystery be not blamed. So let me just pause a moment and say this based on verse 2. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, if you've never been born again, today is the day of salvation for you. We wouldn't want you to leave here today. We wouldn't want you to listen online and not have a personal saving relationship with Jesus because that's the most important relationship in all of life and it will determine your eternal destiny. So today is the day of salvation. But folks, if you're a believer, the verse really in the context here is saying because Jesus has come, because Jesus is the fulfillment because he is the Savior, the Redeemer. He's at the center of this ministry of reconciliation. Stop putting it off. Join in. Start working. Roll up your spiritual sleeve, so to speak, and get to work in this ministry of reconciliation because now is the accepted time. Jesus is fulfilling this, and he wants to empower you and use you. So that's the exhortation. And then he talks about this tribulation, the hardships that's going to come, and he talks about endurance. In fact, in verses 4 and 5, and I'll, I'll read them in a moment, there are nine descriptions that he groups in groups of three. And I would say this. These descriptions are really what it means to follow a crucified Savior, to follow a crucified Christ. And he introduces these, uh, uh, these nine things with the phrase, in much patience. He says in verse 4, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience patience. The word patience means endurance. It means hanging in there. And so I've titled the message, What Does It Take uh, to Stop You? And I've titled the afternoon message, which is not from this text, but uh, a couple of chapters back. What is the secret, the secret of hanging in there? Okay. And so he's going to tell us in much patience, in much, ador uh, much endurance. How? What kind of uh, things must be endured? Well, look at how he begins. In afflictions, he says. That is, in all kinds of trouble. And then, verse 4, in necessities. That is, things that, uh, that uh, place strong demands on me and place strong pressure in my life. This is the kind of things I have to endure if I'm going to be a worker together with him. And then he says, in distresses in that fourth verse, and that refers to frustrating situations in which you feel like you're cornered or you're hemmed in and you can't turn to the, you don't know which way to turn. You can't, you're hemmed in. Distresses. And then he says in verse 5, in stripes, well, that doesn't mean prison uniforms, but in stripes means uh, the beatings that Paul suffered. Do you know he was beaten five times by the Jewish people? And he was beaten three times by the Gentiles. I haven't been beaten yet for the Lord. I don't know if I ever will. 
But that's a part of tribulation that Paul suffered that he had to endure. And there are people in countries around this globe that are believers that have suffered beatings that are being beaten on a regular basis. If you've ever read the book, for instance, Tortured for Christ by uh, Wormbrandt, he was beaten all the time. He was in, in prison in Romania for 16 years, and he was beaten. Paul was beaten. He, it, stripes, he calls him. Imprisoned. Well, we know that he was imprisoned, at least in, in uh, the city of Philippi, remember, uh, when the Philippian jailer was gloriously saved. As a result, that's what that was all about. And a church was, was birthed there imprisonments. And he says in verse five, in tumults and tumults or riots. Oh, they, they would say that when Paul entered a town, there'd either be revival or rioting, sometimes both. <laughs> but uh, he, he suffered a riot when he was first saved in the, in the Syrian city of Damascus. And of course, there was a riot over him in Jerusalem. And then uh, in Antioch and Lystra and Thessal Thessalonica and Berea and Corinth. And I was in the, the, the stadium in Ephesus, the ruins of it, where there was a mob. You remember his co-workers wouldn't allow him to go into that. They protected him from it. But anyway, two malls. Oh, yeah, many of them. And then the next uh, three... Uh, he says, in labors, and of course, he's referring just to the hard work and the, the strict effort that is necessary in being in ministry. It wears you out. It's hard on the body, he said. He says, in watchings, and that means he spent sleepless nights. I don't know why. Maybe he was burdened and prayed, or maybe he had to work nights in order to uh, pay the bills because he was a tent maker. And then also it says in fastings, and to, uh, I looked at that, and that means that he, he skipped meals at times voluntarily because he had work to do. He had things that he had to accomplish in ministry, and so he would sacrifice a meal in order to do that. Would you be willing to even do that? This is the list of tribulation that he talks about that he took on because of being a co-worker with God, being a co-laborer with him, working together to get out this message of reconciliation. Thankfully, it doesn't stop there. And, you know, here's the thing, folks. There's a lot of discouragement in the Christian life and in ministry. But God balances that with encouragement. And really what we see here in verses uh, 6 through 10 is really a lot of encouragement that uh, Paul uh, just keys in on. As I said, in verses 4 and 5, what Paul endured, what is endured in ministry, that's a picture of what it means to follow the crucified Christ. But in verses 6 to 10, here is not endurance, but encouragement. It, it, it's what it means to have the risen Christ living in you. This is what it means. It's how a spirit-filled believer responds to tribulation. Well, look at it with me. Beginning in, in the, um, the sixth verse, he says, by pureness. That is, it's speaking about outward moral purity or blamelessness, outwardly blameless. No one could look at his life and lay a finger of blame upon him by purity. And then he says in verse 6, by knowledge. And what he's talking about there is that God had not only given him the ability to, leave, to live a morally clean life, but God gave him insight and understanding into his scripture into the word of God by knowledge. And then he says in that same sixth verse, by long suffering, long suffering, that is being unwilling to retaliate against all of the ill treatment, the bad way he was treated very unjustly. 
very unfairly, and yet by long suffering. It, you know, <laughs> that's a that's a fruit of the spirit. Just that that long suffering attitude where you refuse to retaliate against those that have mistreated you. And then again in verse six, he says, by kindness. That is just acts of goodness. And isn't goodness a fruit of the spirit as well? So what are we talking about here? We're talking about a spirit-filled life and ministry. And he goes on in the uh, sixth verse and he says, by the Holy Ghost. This is how it all was accomplished. All of this, the purity, the understanding, the long suffering, the kindness, it was by the Holy Spirit. It was Holy Spirit enabled. It's not something that you can muster up in your flesh. It's not something that you can live out by sheer self-effort. No, he says, I did this by the Holy Spirit. He enabled me. He empowered me. He gave me supernatural strength and ability to do this. He changed my attitude supernaturally. And he says in that sixth verse, by love unfeigned. That is, I really loved the people, even when they were persecuting me. I had loved the love of Christ, constrained me, compelled me, gripped me, hemmed me in, and held me on the mark. And then he says in verse 7, by the word of truth. That is, the word of God never misleads people. It's the word of truth. And I preach that word and I never misled people when I stuck to giving them the word of truth. He says in verse seven, by the power of God, this is how he did it. By the power of God, by the life transforming power of God in me that I communicated to my hearers. And then he says in verse seven, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Now, it's a little confusing, but I understand that Roman soldiers, when they went into battle, they had their sword in their right hand and their shield in the left hand. He's talking about spiritual warfare. He's talking about spiritual defenses. The sword of the spirit in the right hand and the shield of faith in the left hand. He will say in chapter 10 and verse 3 that the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. They're not human. They're supernatural. They're spiritually empowered. They are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the demolishing, the actual crushing of spiritual satanic strongholds in the mind, in the life. And so he's talking about the sword of the spirit. And above all, taking the sword of the spirit, Paul says in another passage, that sword of the spirit is the word of God, he tells us. And the word of God is sharper than any two-edged physical sword. The spiritual sword of the spirit, the Bible, is able to go deeper than flesh and blood, joint and marrow. It's able to go into the immaterial, unseen part of the human life and divide between the soul and the spirit and lay bare the very thoughts and intents or motives of our lives. Wow. On the right hand, the sword of the spirit, left hand, the shield. What's the shield of faith? The shield of faith is that you simply believe God. You believe God. You depend upon him to wield that sword of the spirit, that you come preaching and ministering this word of reconciliation, not in word only, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's talking about here. But he goes on. And we have a whole bunch of paradoxes here, uh, beginning in the next verse, 8 uh, through 10. He says, by honor and dishonor, you know what? Here's what you got to get to. As a Christian, as a Christian person, and as someone that serves the Lord, you got to come to this. You got to realize, you know what? I'm going to suffer some dishonor, but it's okay because if I take it the right way, 
in the spirit that God intends me to take it, he's going to honor me. By honor and dishonor. Dishonor would be man's opinion. Honor would be God's opinion. What matters to you anyway? What really matters to you at the end of the day? What people think about you or what God thinks about you? And what God knows about you? By honor and dishonor. And then he says in that eighth verse, by evil report and good report. Evil report would be misinformation that gets spread about you. Good report would be the truth about you. Maybe the truth isn't good truth. I don't know, but you want it to be. You want it to be. So evil report, good report. And then another paradox here. Uh, he says, as deceivers and yet true. That is, we're sometimes thought of as liars, as not uh, not speaking the truth, as being deceptive. I don't want that to be, I don't want people to say that about me and it be true. I want it to be a lie that they would call me a deceiver. So a liar, maybe the opponents would call you that, but God calls you a faithful messenger of this word. Of reconciliation. And then he says in verse 9, as unknown yet well known, another paradox, unknown yet well known, you're minimized. You know, we're the off scouring of the world, really. We're the scum. They, we're, we're what stands in the way of the devil having his full sway on this planet. We stand in the way of the God of this world. And so, as, as a result, we're nothing. We are minimized in the eyes of the world. We don't have clout. But he says, as unknown and yet known, God knows them that are his. God, you know what's important to me? Even more important that I know God, God knows me. He knows me. And in the world's eyes, I can be minimized. But I want, in God's eyes, to be impactful upon this city that he's put me in. And then he says in verse 9, as dying, and behold, we live. Another contrast and comparison here. Outwardly, we're dying. I'm looking at dying people. You're looking at a dying man. We're in the process of dying. Doesn't matter what age you are, we're dying outwardly. The outward man is perishing. He told us that in chapter 4, verse 16. But he said the inward man is renewed day by day. So inwardly, outwardly, we're, we're, we're dying. Inwardly, we live because guess who lives in us? Christ lives in you. And that's your hope of glory. And then he says in the ninth verse, as chastened and not killed, as punished, and yet my life is spared. And then he says in verse 10, as sorrowful and yet rejoicing. There is that mixture of human sadness that is, it's part of being a human being. Can't deny this. This is all reality. This is truth. Sorrowful human sadness, yes, we have it, but we also, in the midst of it, we have rejoicing. We have the fruit of the Spirit, which is a supernatural joy that he implants in us and infuses through us in the midst of sorrowfulness. And then he says, as poor, yet making many rich. I don't think any of us sitting here this morning could actually say we're poor. When we compare ourselves with the rest of the world, there's no way we're poor. But Paul, he knew what it was to have abundance, and he knew what it was to live without the necessities. He says that in Philippians 4. He'd learn to be content, whichever. But he says... In this point, I, I have suffered 
poverty. I've been absolutely destitute. But that didn't stop me from spiritually enriching, enriching others. You don't have to have money to spiritually enrich other people. You just have to have a rich life with the Lord. You just have to be spiritually rich, and you can enrich others regardless of what your financial status might be. And then he, the last thing he says in verse 10 is, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. What does he mean by that? Well, you know, if you serve the Lord, you have to be willing to lose it all, even your own life. In fact, spiritually, you have to lose your own life. Spiritually, you have to say no to self. You have to die to your own ambitions. But in doing so, you don't suffer loss. You gain your life, right? Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. He that saves his life will lose it, but he that loses his life for my sake, Jesus says, he will gain his life. And that's what he's talking about here. It's the loss and gain. This is the, These paradoxes are really all about the spirit-filled life, the Christ in you coming out through your life. It's spiritual maturity. It's the balance that the Spirit of God gives us. Okay, <laughs> that was all just about how Satan gets us to stop through tribulation. What's another way he does? He tries to, well, in the midst of our tribulation, <laughs> It's such a blessing. It's such a reprieve to be able to come back to a loving family when you're really going through difficulties. One of the things that uh, that pastors and, and full-time Christian workers need is good family life. But you know what? We're talking here about our spiritual family, the church. One of the blessings in the midst of a difficult tribulation and hardship in serving the Lord is to have the reprieve of coming into a fellowship like this, where you have a loving spiritual family that will embrace you and encourage you and, uh, and stand with you. And this is what Paul longs for in this local church in Corinth. Look at what he says in verse 11. Oh, you Corinthians, our mouth is open to you. We haven't held anything back. Our heart is enlarged. Our heart is just, it's full for you. But you're straightened in us. What he means is that you've restricted your heart toward us. The bowels talks about the love, their affections. The, these Corinthians they're refusing to reciprocate the love that Paul showed to them. So one of the ways in which Satan seeks to get us to stop is to have us feel unloved, that we don't have the affection that we give to others reciprocated to us. We don't have that re reprieve. So he appeals here for the Corinthians to reciprocate their love back to him, to open their heart to him as wide as he had opened his heart to them. That's what he's saying. To embrace me, verses 11 and the first part of verse 12, despite no warm response from this church, Paul still has a strong affection toward them. He shared his heart love openly in what he spoke, what he said to them, he shared himself freely with them, his love. And so in verses 12 and 13, he's appealing to them. He's entreating them. He embraced them and he now entreats them. He's seeking mutual affection from them. Like a, a parent would want that kind of treatment and affection from the child that affection that exists between them. I don't think that I can overemphasize the importance that God places in the Bible, and especially the New Testament, on brotherly love, on us loving one another. I mean, 
Jesus himself said that is really the hallmark of the believing life. That is what the lost world sees mostly, that you love one another. They're going to mark it down. Oh, they are Jesus followers. Look at how they love one another. And that love, when it is not there, Satan can use that. When we don't love, when we don't return affection in the fellowship among ourselves to each other, Satan can use that to bring about a desire to just quit. There's a third and final thing that Satan will use. If the enemy can't stop us with tribulation and unreturned affection, then he'll try to trip us up with some doctrinal or moral compromise that he would uh, cleverly get us to, to, to make. Here's what he says in verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness, justice with injustice, unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord, what agreement hath Christ with? Belial is a name for Satan. What communion hath or concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Verse 16, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Talk to the whole church. You're the temple of the living God. As he said, I will dwell in them. I'll walk in them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. The enemy wants to use some doctrinal or moral compromise to trip you up. Talking about inconsistency here. He And the call is for just... To avoid being mismatched, be not unequally yoked or mismatched with unbelievers. It's a call to not be mismatched, to not be in a close partnership with lost people, with unbelievers. And he's really hearkening back to Deuteronomy 22, where the Jewish people were told not to yoke together a donkey and an ox to plow a field. The donkey's unclean. The ox is clean animal. The donkey uh, does it one way. The ox does it another way. You are to plow with two oxen, okay? And so that was an unequal yoke, in literally, in uh, their agricultural world. But he uses that as the basis to say, don't weaken your standards, Don't compromise your ability to maintain a consistent Christian witness. This is a call to consistency. It's a call to not be inconsistent. It's a call to what he calls separation. It's a principle of separation. Now, let me say this. To separate yourself from unbelievers is not to isolate yourself from them. You know the difference between isolation and insulation? Paul tells the Corinthian church in chapter 5 of the first letter that he wrote to them, you don't go out of the world. You don't refuse to have nothing to do with lost people, but you you, you have to live in this world. You have to have some type of communication and relationships among them. But what he's saying here is separate yourself from close partnerships with lost people with unbelievers. What would some of them be? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is marriage. And Paul says again in his first letter, chapter 7, he sums up everything he had to say about marriage in the 39th verse. And what he says there is, if a woman's husband dies, then she is free to marry whomever she will, but only in the Lord. Not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, could uh, could uh, uh, also, I think, apply to close business relationships with unbelievers that would compromise your witness, 
It's a call to consistency, not isolate yourself, but separate yourself because you as a believer are incapable of, of uh, harmoniously coexisting with people that don't know Jesus. And then he reinforces that with a whole bunch of Old Testament quotes that I'm not going to take the time to go over with you and look up. But it's... Uh, He's warning them about inconsistency. And then he talks about integrity in verse 16, where, where he talks about uh, what agreement hath temple of God with idols. You're the temple of the living God. Here's the thing. I don't believe in what some people call second degree separation. I believe that that is, that is mistaken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 uh, for church. That's church discipline going on there. What I believe is what is said here, that believers are to separate from unbelievers. They are not to be in close relationships with them. And by the way, check out who your best friends are. Think about who your closest uh, uh, relationships are with. If they're with unbelievers, that's a problem. That's a problem. It's not that you shouldn't be friendly. <laughs> it's not that you shouldn't have any relationship with law. It's just that you should not have close partnership or relationships with them. And uh, he says, you're the temple of the living God. You know, if you're in a wrong relationship that is uh, spoken of here, you ought to get out of it. <laughs> Basically, that's what he's saying. That doesn't mean that you dissolve a marriage. It's oh, That's done. That's until death do you part. But if it's a business relationship that you have closely with a lost person, you got to back out of that as quickly and as uh, graciously as you can. There's a responsibility to withdraw from wrong relationships with lost people for this purpose to to ensure and maintain your devotion to Jesus because you might not think they they will not impact you they will they'll get you to make wrong decisions ungodly decisions compromising decisions and so you know whether it be a pagan temple or not all temples are jealously guarded against being desecrated. And so he's saying here, hey, you're the temple of the living God. You should be jealously guarding the temple, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come out from among them, he says in that 17th verse. Come out from, a, you know, there are certain places that believers shouldn't go. You know, there are people, certain people that believers should not associate with. There are certain principles that believers should not accept because belonging to Jesus really matters. It's really important. It really matters. That's why we have these kinds of warnings here about separation. And I like how he closes it in the last two verses. After he says, come out from among them, be separate, he says, Touch not the unclean thing. And look at intimacy. I will receive you. Talking to believers, I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you. You'll be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. He's, I will identify myself with you. We're identified with God. That's why we're called to separate and repudiate ungodly associations and relationships because of, of who God wants to be to you, a father, and you his child, and what God wants to do in you. <laughs> That's what he's talking about here. We could uh, say more about this. I, I would simply say this. That in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God gives a promise to the house of David, to David, that his dynasty would, would be forever. And he says, and I will be a father to you and you will be my son. And I think that is the illusion that uh, Paul is 
talking about here in that 18th verse. Because that dynasty promised to David was going to be fulfilled in David's son, the Messiah. Not just Solomon, but ultimately in the son, Jesus, the Messiah. And we're in him. And so we're his sons. We're his daughters. We're part of his family. Isn't it a marvel that long before we were ever, human beings were ever created, God had a, had a heavenly family, but he wanted an earthly family. He created the earth and he created an earthly family. And the earthly children rebelled against him. And so that reconciliation of the cross is to bring the family members back. They've all disenfranchised themselves from God. He's bringing them back. He wants us to be his sons and daughters. What a wonderful thing to be a child of God. And to be able to say, Papa, that's who he is. That's the intimacy that he wants with us. That's what he's talking about here. I read about a missionary. His name was James Gilmore. He was a missionary to that place where my son Jordan visited last summer, to Mongolia, back in the 1800s, the last part of the 19th century. And because uh, of the constant travel that he had to engage in to reach these nomadic tribes, he couldn't find anyone to join up with him and, and to partner with him in ministry. We had a hard time of it. After four years of traveling all across Mongolia, still no man would join him in that ministry. So God graciously provided him a wife. And so more than ever, he, the couple hauled their, their tent across deserts and mountains in Mongolia during the bitterest winter weather. They made contact with Mongolians. And he began to see, Gilmore began to see more than ever before that uh, he needed prayer. He needed to emphasize the vital role of prayer uh, for their isolated Mongolian uh, mission. He, he knew that only God could change the hearts of these people. And so they began to pray themselves like never before, and they would uh, ask people, back in the homeland to pray uh, for these Mongolian people. And uh, after 11 years of, of marriage, his wife Emily died, and uh, he couldn't find anyone else to join him, so he continued without any company. He went through prolonged periods of loneliness where he would feel very despondent, and yet he pressed on. In his journal, he records words like, I felt blue today. But God would pay him by sending rays of hope into that darkness, and he would see someone saved here or there along the way. He was sent back home because he got very ill, worn down. He had to go home and recuperate from both physical and emotional exhaustion. But eight months later, he returned to Mongolia. And later, uh, he would rejoice in what God would do. But I thought about that when I was reading. How could this guy continue with these kinds of odds? It kind of reminded me of 2 Corinthians 6. And, of course, the list in the 11th chapter that Paul gives as well. How could he do this? What sustained him when he didn't see a whole bunch of Mong Mongolians coming to Christ? They weren't really interested. Well, he prayed. He believed the promises that God uh, would reward in the end. Um, he didn't believe that ministry would be easy. And so he pressed on. And uh, he just believed in a future. A future hope, a future uh, reward. Um, um, in gathering, and so he pressed forward. Didn't stop. Spent his whole life there. What does it take to stop you? What does it take to stop you just from going on with the Lord? What does it take to stop you from doing God's will? Listen to me, young people. 
Jesus said this. There were people that wanted to follow him. And he warned them. He said, oh, you want to follow me? Well, let me just warn you ahead of time. Uh, the birds have nests. Foxes have dens in the, in, the, in the hillside. But he said, the son of man, he doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. You want to follow me? And then he, uh, he was uh, confronted by another person that said, hey, I'll follow you. But, you know, uh, let me first go and, and say goodbye to my family. And, Jesus, and, and another guy said, let me first bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. In other words, let lost people take care of that kind of stuff. You come follow me and preach the word of God. Preach the gospel. And then he said this. And this impacted me as a young man. Any man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. If God has impressed upon your heart, follow me, whatever the cost, follow me. It's like you put your hands to the plow and you're looking straight ahead. You're following him. You see Jesus ahead. You're following because he went before you. You're following him. If you look back, you veer off. You look back, you veer off. You don't stay focused on the Lord and you make a crooked furrow in your plowing. Any man that put his hand to the plow, Jesus said, and looks back is not fit for my kingdom. Young people, don't look back. Do what you feel God is leading you to do. Don't look back. Don't quit. Don't let Satan get the victory here and stop you from doing the will of God. I know of people, and I don't know for sure whether this is the reason, but I know of people that God called them to a particular life of ministry. And they had good intentions of doing it, but they got distracted by maybe a job or making more money in the world, and they never got around to do it. And their life is a mess. Their life is a mess today. He that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Never look back. What does it take to stop you? Don't let Satan stop you and deceive you from following Jesus and his will.